So let's just pray that the Lord will open up our hearts and our minds for what he wants to feed us this morning. Lord, we just thank you that we could celebrate your resurrection today. We, we, we thank you for the, the joy that was set before you on Friday night. And then we thank you that you rose from the dead, that you came out of the tomb on Sunday morning, and that the first person you saw was Mary, and that we can take heart from that because she had a difficult background, Lord. And you don't, you don't look at us and judge us by the outside. You look at our heart. And, and you found somebody in the garden that was there to worship you. And, and Lord, we want to be those people, regardless of our past. So we pray all distractions would be blocked out right now. We could just focus in on what you want to say to us through your word and by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, this picture just really got to me. Uh, we're trying to just tell people what we're going to be talking about. And this is actually what uh, we talked about last week. And it, the traditional version of this verse in John 15, 13 would be, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for a friend. And our friend Brian Simmons is the one who wrote the Passion Translation. And he said it this way, the greatest love of all is a love that sacrifices all. All right? It's a little different than no greater love, uh, that the way we understand it. But this is for us. This is for us to understand that if we're going to model ourselves after Jesus, it's going to require sacrificial love. That's at agape, not based on conditional love. Um, and then I had done this two years ago um, for Easter, Passover, Resurrection Sunday. We call all three of those names are valid. And uh, I went through something that the Lord had showed me about uh, the timing of the, of the Lord. And you can, you can watch it. This was just reposted again. You can find it easy enough. Because this would have been like part one of today's going to be part two. That was part one. If, if that would help you at all. But when we were at Glory of Zion that year in 2019, I had a vision while we were worshiping, and I saw a clock spinning up behind the altar. Like if you were looking up here, it would have been going around this way. And that's a very biblical mindset. You know, the, the Hebrew people think more in cycles and circles than we do. We think in a linear timeline. And, and God doesn't think that way. When, when you read through the Bible, that's what the Sabbath is about. It's the end of a cycle, seven days. On the seventh day, you rest, right, so that you can be recharged. You can look back on the week before. You can look ahead. Then each month is a time to think about how was that last month and what do I expect God to do this month. And we take time and we honor the Lord in, in that first fruit season. We bring an offering that, because you bless me, I'm ready to give more, Lord, because you said, the little I give you the whole rest of the lump will be blessed, right? And then there were three feasts that all of Israel was expected to come to Jerusalem and come together as a family of God. And, and aren't you glad that the Jewish people were as tenacious as they were to keep writing down the Bible for us? Because there have been many times throughout history that that could have been completely lost. But because of their tenacity and their love for the word, we still have it today. And you should be real happy about that. Because where would we be without the word of God, right? Whoa. Um, so that would be part one. And then I also just thought to show you this is on the cover of our, our YouTube channel. If, you know, if we needed a verse that helped try to sum up what we're trying to do on the YouTube channel is taken from the NIV version of 2 Corinthians 3.18. This says that we are being transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. All right? Can you look at somebody and say, you are, you are being, being transformed, transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. Yeah, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Especially with a mask on. <laughs> I do have a bitter root judgment against the mask, so I, I repent right now. <laughs> so this is part of why you see this cyclical motion behind the cross, is, is the idea of that cycle, because I really feel like it's key in, in God's timing and also, a lot of the teaching that we give in the Possessing Your Vessel class talks about how you need to break cycles. And Trisha just mentioned what she'll be sharing on this Monday night, tomorrow night, is generational curses. There's a cycle of behavior that can be inherited in our family line. And you might think, now, once I became a Christian, all that's gone. You know, our, our experience as pastors for now, you know, 35 years of total ministry time, 22 as pastors, is... You're, you're a new creation when you get saved, but you're a baby, right? You're on the milk, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with being on the milk, but God doesn't want you to stay on the milk, right? right? If you have a 20-year-old child, you don't want them in diapers, well, drinking a bottle. 
we're expected to grow, we're expected to mature. So there could be things that are still holding on because they might have a legal right to be, be hanging on to us, okay? Uh, another day's teaching, but just understand that that's a core principle for us, that just because you're saved and you're a Christian doesn't mean you still shouldn't be working through a sanctification process. We are being transformed into the image. Yes, you took on his image when you got saved, but now there's that working out of our salvation. Now there's that going from the milk to the meat. And you could be a meat eater in one area, but still be drinking the milk over here. Okay, so there's different parallel things, and that has to do with this cycle idea that I'm going to try to touch on today. Uh, it is finished, and you know that probably, you would know that that comes as the last words that Jesus spoke when he was on the cross. It's not the last words of his in the Bible because the resurrected Jesus is talking too, right? Um, so that would have been, you know, today uh, being the day of the resurrection, he appeared to Mary in the garden, and then he appeared on the, on the road to Emmaus, and then he saw the apostles later that day, and, and it, it looked like him, but it didn't look like him. Remember, he was able, like, to cloak himself almost, and his body had different characteristics because he didn't come in through the door when he saw the apostles. He just showed up. Now, the thing you should get excited about that is is that when our bodies get resurrected, we're going to have similar attributes, yeah. right? We're not going to be bound by, you know, the gravity problem that life brings. <laughs> you know, gravity eventually wins in this world because, you know, out of dust we were formed and out of dust we return. And, you know, I won't talk about gravity along the way, but it's not pretty, I promise. Um, so it's always trying to pull us down, right? And Jesus is saying, no, I'm giving you a better law. You have a law of lift. Though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed and restored day by day. So in John 19, this is when Jesus is on the cross. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. They filled the sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine... He said, say it with me, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And, and I'm guessing a lot of you have studied this in one way or another, if you've been a Christian any length of time. What was finished? Right? There's so many things that we could look at about what was finished. And on the surface, I think the answer most of us should have been taught was that the debt that mankind owed to God for the sin that we lived in was paid. Paid in full. Right? No more. There's no bill. There's no open uh, billing cycle, right? You get the bill in the mail, it says zero balance. Nothing owed anymore. Your sin was paid for by Jesus. And therefore, you should be very grateful about that, right? Now, but think about it. It doesn't mean you never sin as a Christian because you will still sin. There's going to be times that you'll drop the ball. That's not a negative confession. That's just understanding that we have to mature in the Lord. And if you judge somebody, that could be a sin, right? And we're very uh, reluctant to think that we might be judging somebody, but our actions often would, would indicate that we are. Not my job to decide that. That's up to you. But to the point is, we got delivered from the nature of sin so that when it happens as a Christian, you're much more aware of it now, right? You remember when you first got saved? It's like, oh boy, that's illegal. I'm in trouble. Because <laughs> you just got so used to doing things a certain way. And now the Lord is saying, no, I have a better life for you. And it might take some time to break those old habits. So we'll talk about what he might have meant when he said it was finished. But I also want to just still connect it to the Passover feast that the Jews were celebrating. And there could be parts of the gospel that seem confusing when Jesus would say to, to people that got healed, don't say anything to anybody. You'd be like, why not? Why, why wouldn't you want to tell them about this great healing that happened? And it's because this cycle had to finish on Passover. Jesus had to go to the cross on Passover in order for the full effect to take, to take place that he understood. So, you know, there's, if you're not totally sure about something in the Bible, it's probably because there's a deeper level meaning that's yet to be revealed. And that's okay. But this is what he saw. Uh, John, actually, his cousin, John the Baptist, was the cousin of Jesus. And way back in John chapter 1, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, that's a lot of revelation, isn't it? For that prophet, John the Baptist was a prophet, and he could see way in advance that his cousin was the Lamb of God. What does that mean? They would bring a lamb to sacrifice at Passover. 
And, and that's what they ate in Egypt before they left. The blood was on the door. Boom, we're going. We're out of here, right? The death angel passes over, and they go. So that lamb represented the sacrifice that they were bringing, not a broken-legged lamb. And that's why if people try to contend with you about Jesus uh, having an equal, as, as Tricia said, he has no equal, right? He was the son of God. He was God in the flesh, and he was also fully human. If he had sinned, it wouldn't have been the perfect sacrifice. So he lived 33 years without sin. First time that had ever happened. Only time it ever has happened. And that's why it was so effective when he came out of the tomb, because he had lived through a cycle of life without ever sinning. And that broke the cycle of death. So you see this picture. You see how dramatic it is? Like, boom, it's finished. Everything that happened in the past, all that prior cyclical stuff that was pulling you down, that's finished. The cycle of death is broken. And now you have the ability to step into a cycle of life. And when I say the ability, it has to be your choice. It doesn't happen automatically. And that's part of being transformed part is that Jesus said that we have to pick up our cross daily and follow him. It's not his cross, it's our cross. And anybody that's been saved any length of time knows that just because you know that something's true in your head doesn't mean it's translated down into your body yet, right? And often when you're fasting, that will be some of the times that the, the things that are most fleshly about you that, 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 are, that are not godly will surface. And that's a really good reason to fast, isn't it? Unless you just don't want to face it, and that's, you know, that's up to you. See, because if you don't face it, you're just going to live with that thing longer. But So you can either have the pain of the discipline of dealing with it or the pain of regret for not dealing with it. I'd rather have the pain of the discipline personally. That's, you know, what each one of us has to decide. And you should be open to other people if they say, you know, I don't know if you realize how you're coming across. I think you think it's coming across this way, but you might want to pray about this. That's a really valuable thing to have in your life. Don't get defensive about that. Just say, sure, I mean, you're right, I hadn't thought of it. Let me pray about it, right? That's a, that's a healthy sign of maturity when you can do that. And, and why wouldn't we want to be the most effective ministers for Christ? Because if something's holding us back and there's parts of our character that still need redeeming, right? We've been redeemed. We're going to heaven if we die because we accept Christ. It's not has nothing to do with your salvation. It has to do with the effectiveness as a minister. And that's what blows people out of the water when they find out about a famous person living in sin. And we could just say it, right? Rabbi Zacharias' uh, issue right now is a very, very difficult one to, to wrestle with. And, and part of what's difficult is if he could be literally one of the most brilliant defenders of the truth of the gospel, how did it not translate into his behavior, right? And, and if it's true, it, it appears... Um, know enough about inside information on that one to believe that it is true. And, and if there is a problem, your own organization should be the ones that are calling you out on it, right? That, that's how it should be, and that's what happened. And it doesn't mean that what he was teaching was wrong. It just means that there wasn't this full integration of everything he knew in, his, in the theory part into his body, and his body controlled him more than the knowledge of the word did. And that's a real wake-up call, isn't it? So it's not a matter that we'll never sin again. It's a matter of when we recognize it, are we able to cut it off? If King David, when he was up on the, on the rooftop and looked over that edge and saw Bathsheba, if he had just turned his back and walked away, what a different story we would have had, right? But he didn't. There was, a, there was something in the immune system that the devil found a weakness, and he stayed and he lingered a little too long. He wrote the Psalms. He was in the cave, could have killed Saul, and got convicted for just cutting a little piece off his robe, and yet here was a besetting sin that was still in his root system that brought the whole country down. Take down the leader. You get the people who follow him, too, often. So this is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 4. We talked about how even John the Baptist recognized Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And I'm guessing there might be one or two Catholic people who grew up in the Catholic background. I'm one of them. We said that one all the time. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Didn't know what it meant, but said it. <laughs> and nothing wrong. No, there's a lot of believers in the Catholic Church, so I don't mean to be critical there. 
But Luke 4, Jesus standing in uh, the synagogue where he was, his local synagogue, they hand him the scroll of Isaiah and he opens up to this part and Luke 4, 19, he quotes from Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he's anointed me to be hope for the poor, healing for the brokenhearted, new eyes for the blind and to preach to prisoners, you are set free. That's good news, isn't it? That's good news. I have come to share the message of jubilee. Now, you know, that means that's, that word is weighted with some power in the Old Testament, right? Jubilee was every 50 years, all the debts were forgiven. And that's what Pentecost represented. 50 days after Passover, you came Pentecost because it honored Moses getting the law in the Old Testament. It was 50 days after Passover that God gave them the law. And then it was 50 days after Jesus' crucifixion that he gave us Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad about Holy Spirit? Oh my, oh my. And I'm sorry that it got a little, you know, the Holy Spirit has a bad rap, I think, because of the Pentecostal movement in the early days. Thing, people did things in excessive ways. And, you know, look, uh, again, another day's topic, but here's how I want you to look at it, is that God loves me so much that he didn't just give me something I have to read. He gave me his own spirit to live right inside of me. Because what if I can't read? Then I'm in trouble. And there's plenty of people out, you know, in, in developing countries that can't read. They don't have the luxury of being able to go to school. And the genius of Jesus is that whether the person is a PhD scholar or somebody very broken at the other end of the spectrum, his truth still applies to everybody's life at, at any end and everybody in between. Isn't that amazing? Because a lot of times, if you have professors like me, you knew that they understood the material, but you weren't understanding the way they were explaining it, were you? So a brilliant teacher can have 50 different people in the room and every one of them walk away and feel like, wow, I'll never be the same again. That was Jesus. I've come to share the message of Jubilee, which I'm saying, telling you to think of it as Pentecost, for the time of God's great acceptance has begun. And if you're struggling with a problem, and you know, church is going to be talking about generational curses, right? The fact that Holy Spirit is living inside of you, and Jesus is our model, lets us feel like it doesn't matter what the problem is. It's not too big for God. And he gave me his spirit right inside me, so the things that I couldn't do in my own natural strength, I can do by the strength of the spirit that's inside of me. So that's the inward benefit of it. The outward benefit, you read about the gifts of the spirit, prophecy, healing, awesome miracles, signs and wonders. It's all powered by the Holy Spirit, but it also starts with us. He's living right inside of us. And if we find things coming out of our mouth that don't line up with the way the Lord tells us, it's not because the Holy Spirit thinks that's a good idea. It's because we haven't yielded that part of ourselves to him yet. And he'll do it. He'll, he'll give you the strength to do what you can't do in the natural. I got real excited about that. I don't know why you guys aren't, but that's okay. <laughs> So we used to sing a song that really helped me understand this verse many, 25 years ago. And it's based on, the first part is, is based on Psalm 137, verse 1 and 2. It says, along the banks of Babylon's rivers, we sat as exiles, right? And you know, that's what happened to the Jewish people. They got taken away. Jerusalem was burned down. Uh, the prophet Daniel, right, from the book of Daniel, was one of the slaves that was taken out of Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, right? So he was... You know, you can tie all this in with the linkage. So this psalm is talking about when they were in captivity. These are the people that were, were free at one time that became slaves, and now they're in Babylon, and by the rivers there, it says, we sat down as exiles, mourning our captivity, and we wept with great love for Zion. They, they wished they could be back, but they were in the captivity of slavery. Our music and mirth were no longer heard, only sadness. Have any of you ever experienced that? where you went through something in your life and the, and the music stopped in your heart? You know what I'm talking about? Can you wave a hand at me? Because with these masks on, I can't tell if you're sleeping. Or, or Okay, good. Okay, good. So this definitely happened to me. I, I can very vividly remember uh, through a tragedy that happened in my life that as I was walking, because I've been a musician most of my life up to that point. I was probably in my early 20s when what I'm about to tell you happened. And I was walking outside. And it was a real windy, cold winter night. It was really dark outside, and, 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 I, and I thought to myself inside, man, I don't have any song left anymore. 
the songs God because I was so depressed over, over something that had happened, a tragedy that happened in my life. And that's just like the devil, isn't it, to do that because that's where the power comes from. So here these folks are. They were musicians and singers, but they're sitting by the banks of a river in captivity, and it says, we were mourning for Zion, and we only had sadness, so we hung up our harps on the willow tree. See, that's not where the harp belongs. And you know now, hopefully, that if you're starting to feel something pull you down, go listen to worship music. And you put that song on and you start singing it over yourself. The overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. He's going to chase me down. He's going to find me until I'm found. I'm not alone. Never alone. He won't leave me. He won't forsake me. So that stops that downward spiral. But these folks were still spiraling down. And it's a bigger day's teaching. But there's a, there's a counter to this. When they get free, which is in Psalm 126, it says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion. You see how it's a cycle? They got too much sin going on, so they got taken away to Babylon. Now they're getting freed. And when the Lord brought us out of captivity, now we're in a new place. Boy, our mouths were filled with singing. That's, that's one of the songs that we sing too. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion and we were free, we were like people who were dreaming. You're walking back out of that darkness and it's like, is this real? Pinch me. Am I sleeping? Is this a dream? Just like... When you're in the tragedy, it's like, I hope I'm sleeping and this is just a nightmare. But it's not. You're not having a nightmare. It's really life. So when we came out of captivity, our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was filled with singing. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done, come on, great things for them. Anybody here? Lord's done great things for you? Yeah, don't ever forget to be thankful for that one. All right, so let me just take a little turn on the journey here, okay? Because I said I wanted to think about what could it mean when he says it is finished. And uh, I told you that we know Brian Simmons well. We interviewed him, and, and there's people in our church that served under him in ministry when he was a pastor in Connecticut. And in, in, in part of his translation, he also delves into the Aramaic words as well as the Greek and Hebrew words. And one of the things that he found relates to this verse when in John 19 when Jesus says it's finished. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll read it to you first and then we'll talk about it. In verse 19, I'm sorry, John 19, 28, Jesus knew that his mission was accomplished. Don't you love that word? I mean, look, do you think you have a mission? Is one of the things that we have to translate now because, you know, when we hear the word body of Christ, are we thinking about it literally? We're his body. We're here in the earth doing the things that he would be doing if he was here. It's not just this symbolic picture. No, we're his hands and his feet and his voice. And when you pray for somebody to get healed, it's like, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Flow through me. I'm just the channel that allows it to flow. That's all. No great power in me because as soon as you start taking on that power, then pride is setting in. And there's another besetting sin. Right? So anyway, he knew his mission was accomplished. What was his mission? To break the cycle of death. How did that get here? All the way back in the garden. Adam and Eve had perfect relationship with God. They were naked and unashamed. They sinned and that caused separation. They were evicted. An angel came with a sword and said, you're not getting back in here. Ha, huh. problem. And all of us have suffered because of that. So Jesus had to come and reverse that curse. So they took on the sin. Now another Adam had to come, live a completed life, no sin. When he died, he became the perfect sacrifice because of no sin. So if somebody tries to tell you it was just a good prophet, no, sorry. That wouldn't have gotten it done, would it? The cross was important, but without the resurrection, the cross wouldn't matter. The only way death was defeated was when he came out of the tomb. Okay, so when he said it is finished, man, yes, he paid for our sin, but now everybody that comes after this is going to have a chance for eternal life flowing, even the thief on either side. Amazing, right? How much time did that guy have to live? An hour? Lord, remember me. Today, you'll be with me. Oh, man, don't, don't let people make it too complicated. Jesus knew that his mission was accomplished and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. They soaked the sponge with sour wine and put it on a stalk of hyssop and raised it to his lips. 
Anybody know what scripture they're talking about there? It's from Psalm 22. I won't go into it now, but I did on part one. You can look at it. But Psalm 22 is an exact presentation of a crucifixion written by David 700 years before this even happened. And when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember that? That's verse 1 of Psalm 22. And all the Jews that were there listening would have known that he was referencing that. So maybe he wasn't showing a sign of weakness, like some people think. Maybe he was just pointing them back to say, I am what David was talking about. You're seeing it happen right before your eyes now. Uh, Mental note, right? Make a mental note to look into that. Be a Berean. And then when he had sipped the sour wine, he said, it is finished, my bride. Mm. I love that. (coughs) Excuse me. Thank you, Brian Simmons. That it is finished, my bride, puts a whole different spin on it, doesn't it? It's finished, my bride. So we were his bride all along, but we were being held captive. We got kidnapped by sin. So the mission that Jesus had was to come and end the cycle of death so that we could be his full bride again. So that that sin could be broken, the power of that sin could be broken off of us and we could live as the bride of Christ, both here and for eternity, right? And you know in the book of Revelation, it talks about that we're gonna be at the feast, the wedding feast of the lamb and we're the bride and the men shouldn't be upset about this. (laughs) It's a good thing to be the bride. Then he bowed his head and surrendered his spirit to God. So let me just build a couple of pieces around that, right? Because in Matthew 20, 28, Jesus said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. And to what? Give his life as a ransom. When do you pay a ransom? When someone's been kidnapped, right? Who got kidnapped? Mankind by the enemy through that initial, initial sin We were kidnapped into that slavery of sin. And then the devil could stand there and keep accusing us of things that really did happen. But he's condemning us. And Jesus said, no, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Right? Right? So it's not that we don't still do things wrong. It's that we don't have to walk in the condemnation of it. We ask for forgiveness. And we repent. And he can tell the difference. You know, do you ever have your children say, say you're sorry. And they go, Sorry. And you're like, no, sorry, do it again and act like you mean it. So, like, this is where you have to realize that God knows if we're truly broken about the sin. And that's why he says, I'm close to those of a broken spirit and a contrite heart, right? That means that you truly are sorry. And if you could do it again, you wouldn't do it again. So he came to give his life as a ransom for many. That was part of his assignment. And we are the ones that were ransomed. Like a bride being in captivity, he ransoms us out. And that made me think of Ruth uh, chapter 410, where we, we learn about the kinsman redeemer. Just lift your hand if you know what I'm talking about, right? You studied this, that if, if a man died, there was an option in there that somebody could step forward and say, I'm going to stand in the gap on behalf of this woman, and, and she's going to become my wife. And that's what Boaz said. I've taken responsibility for Ruth, who we could picture as the ransom bride that's being brought back. The woman from Moab who was married to Malon, who had passed away. She will become my wife. And we can say, we will become the bride of Christ. We already are here, but at the final celebration that's talked about in Revelation 19, that's our role. And once you think of that and you picture that in your mind, it makes it much harder to backslide. It makes it much harder to think less of this book. You start thinking a lot more of this book because your life now has a mission. And we really want to help you find that mission. That's part of the job of the people in the pulpit. The people that are here are to help steward the gifts that are in you and help them develop and grow. And many times we got hurt in church and, and we don't want to try to do that again because we feel vulnerable. So that's another reason, you know, for all the counseling and, and the ministry part is to is to help us get a reset back so that we're operating from the right motives and and in a healthy way. And then you can think of Ephesians, right? It says a man is to leave his father and mother and lovingly hold to his wife. Men, if you're by your wives, go ahead, put the arm around. This would be a good time to do that. It says lovingly hold to his wife. 
since the two have become joined as one flesh. Ha! Huh. We have been joined to Jesus now through his spirit living inside us. We're already his bride. Well, if that's operating in our lives, it's gonna be much harder to sin, right? Because you're gonna be much more aware of the presence of God and you're not gonna want that to leave <laughs> because we can grieve him through our behaviors, right? And it's not a switch like, hold on, Jesus, let me just curse this guy out, I'll be right back. Been tempted to do that? You see why it's such a great mystery to become one. We have friends, John and Cheryl Price. You very rarely say it other than John and Cheryl. It's almost like one name, John and Cheryl just comes out that way. And that's what a good marriage should be, right? Like it's just to become one. And we become one with Christ, if you understand this comparison, because he put his spirit in us, but we have to yield to that spirit that's in us. And it, it's not so much about how it manifests as far as the gifts of the spirit. We want you to speak in tongues. It's an awesome gift that God gave us, but it's also the character that, that drives, the, the fuel that drives the decisions we make. And that means you do, like Trish said, you have to study the Bible. You don't just read it, you study it. And you say, Lord, every morning, get on your knees, take communion. Say, I'm gonna go out of this house today into a very hostile world out there. I don't wanna operate on the algorithm of the old Peter. I wanna operate on the new algorithm from heaven. And it's not so easy to just put everything in a little box and say, if this happens, I'll do this. And if that happens, because you're in the moment. That's the jazz band, not the wedding band, remember? And then I, I already quoted this in, in Revelation 19. I'm almost finishing up here. It says, let us rejoice and exalt him and give him glory because the wedding celebration of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Can you look at somebody and say, you look like a ready bride right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. You look like a ready bride. Yes, yes, yes. That's who we want to be. When I return, will I find faith in the earth? That's what he said. Okay, now it's again, it could sound condemning maybe to somebody, but I'm, I'm really not saying it that way at all. I'm saying if we're not doing that, if we're not merging our day with the Holy Spirit, nobody suffers more than we do. And the people who are counting on us suffer because you're sowing a seed of wind and you're reaping a whirlwind. Bad decision, you get a big bad problem. Good decision, you get the blessing. Works both ways, right? Right? And then I love this one, John 20. We went to Sight and Sound a couple years ago and we saw the, the show of Jesus. I don't know how many remember that, but the scene of Mary is just so amazing. The way they build her character for you to understand, you know, she had seven demons cast out of her. Some people think she had lived as a prostitute. And, uh, and that, you know, the, the fact that she got saved and she was the first one to see Jesus resurrected like that's amazing right because women did not have standing in that culture and never mind a sinful woman just like the woman at the well right why are you talking to me she looks at jesus like you're a jew i'm a woman They're like what are we, why would you want to talk to me and it's like i uh i have water that you're going to want to drink <laughs> changes the life but this is a different mary now this is mary magdalene and and she went to go touch him when she realizes it's him in the garden and he says no don't cling to me for I haven't yet ascended to my father. He's not only my father, Mary. He's not only my father and God, Mary. Now he's your father and your God. This is powerful stuff. Everybody's allowed in. Hallelujah. So Mary is God's daughter in love. <laughs> yeah. It's not in-laws and outlaws. This woman who would have been thrown on the trash heap of life by the legalistic crowd becomes the first one to see Jesus come out of the tomb. And we're still talking about her 2,000 years later. But what about you and me? Is he also my father and God too? Yeah. Yes. Do you see him that way? Yeah. Most of the time, hopefully, but then I would say that what we've learned is when, when some of the behavior is not going well, it's because you didn't fully realize that he was your father and your God because some of that trauma that you're still carrying that hasn't been healed yet, 
And then he says, now go to my brothers and tell them what I've told you, that I'm ascending to my father and your father. He even says it again, just to emphasize, in case you didn't hear me, Mary, he's your father too now. To my God and your God. Quickly, if you want to read about the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter is all about this. And I'll put in a little aside that this is not the last time I'm going to talk about the resurrection. It's not a one Sunday a year thing. It's our hope. The resurrection is our hope. Now you can say, well, I thought dying and going to heaven was our hope, and it certainly is. It beats the alternative. <laughs> but we're not going to spend eternity on clouds playing harps. Okay? We're going to come back. We're going to return to this earth, is what it says, and we're going to rule and reign with Christ. And Paul spells it out in a lot of detail here that I don't have time to go into, but I'll just take a few verses from this chapter. Verse 14 says, If Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching has been for nothing, and your faith is useless. Boy, I'll tell you, Paul just got right up in your face, didn't he? He said, you're not even a Christian if you don't believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead. And there's whole denominations that don't believe that. Don't under, I don't know how to get around this verse. If Christ is not alive, you're still lost in your sins. And your faith is a fantasy. You see why today's the biggest holiday on the whole calendar? It's the resurrection. But Christmas is awesome. The fact that he revealed himself, the advent of his presence was cool. But the resurrection is what, what broke the death cycle. That's what conquered death. Coming out of the tomb. And then it says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. Oh, so nothing's too hard for God. Nothing. <laughs> and then in 21, it says, since death came through a man, Adam, it's fitting that the resurrection of the dead has also come through a man, Christ. The body is sown when we die. Our body's put in the ground in decay, gravity, but will be raised in immortality. It's sown in humiliation, but will be raised in glorification. Sown in weakness, but will be raised in power. Thank you, Lord. I don't know. I just tell you, like, if, if all you're thinking is dying and going to heaven, you're missing this part. Like, that's just a, a staging area before we return with Christ for the final return. Okay, that's another whole day's discussion. Two returns, one more return. I'm not going there today. We should live like, look, li just live like when he comes back, we're going to be with him. Right? And you really, whatever, that's another day, like I said. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last man, Jesus, became a living spirit. Oh, I missed that other verse. I'm going to read it again. It's sown in weakness, but will be raised in power. If there's a physical body, there's also a spiritual body. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last man, Jesus, right? The last Adam was Jesus. He became a living spirit. The first man was from the dust of the earth. The second man, Yahweh, is from the realm of heaven. The first one made from dust has a race of people just like him who are also made from dust. The one sent from heaven has a race of heavenly people who are just like him. Which one do you want to be? Should be a pretty easy choice, right? Once we were carried in the likeness of the man of dust, but now we carry the likeness of the man of heaven. We are being transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. Or not. It's your choice. It doesn't just happen automatically. He doesn't go where he's not welcome most of the time. Sometimes he will. For when that last trumpet is sounded, the dead will come back to life. We will be indestructible and we will be transformed. That's a hope and a promise right there. In Hebrews it says, the better resurrection. For we will discard our mortal bodies and slip into a body that's imperishable. What is mortal will now be exchanged for immortality. Almost done. This is Hebrews now. It says in Hebrews 9, The Messiah did not enter into the earthly tabernacle made by men, which was but an echo of the true sanctuary, but he entered into heaven itself to appear before God in our place. So if you're thinking about when Jesus said, Mary, don't touch me yet, I have not yet ascended to the Father. Right? This is where this fits in. He brought his blood and put it on the mercy seat in heaven, in the tabernacle in heaven. And that's what ended the death cycle. Because that was the sacrifice that needed to be made in order to reverse the curse of Adam and Eve. Makes you want to worship a Savior like that. 
He, he entered into heaven itself to appear before God in our place, the only one who could substitute. And he's appeared at the fulfillment of the ages to abolish sin once and for all. Not just once and for all like the way we use that expression. He did it once, that covered everybody because his blood was way more powerful than bulls and goats by the sacrifice of himself. And then I'll read you one uh, portion from uh, Song of Songs and then we'll, we'll finish. You know Song of Songs, actually, if you know Brian Simmons' story, that book really rocked him and was one of the reasons he ended up writing the Passion Translation. I'm sure glad he did. And he writes it in, in very intimate language, but this is for us, right? We're the bride. And in verse 10 of Psalm, Song of Songs, chapter 2, I think is very much a word for us here today, this group of people, but even America and the rest of the globe, because we've been through a year of trauma with COVID, right? Like just incredible. I don't even think we fully realize the amount of stuff that we've internalized that just still needs to be purged from our, from our pump, right? You ever go camping? and they haven't used the, uh, the, the campground all winter, and you're the first ones there in the spring, you gotta really prime that pump for a while because the first stuff that comes out of that well is pretty nasty. So just, just a nice word picture for you there for, for what we might need to do now, right? It's, Jesus is saying, come away with me. I've come, as you have asked, to draw you into my heart and lead you out. For now is the time, my beautiful one, the season has changed. Say that with me. The season has changed. Say it by faith. Say it by faith. The season has changed. We're coming out of COVID and we're coming into the spring and there's more daylight and there's more sunshine and we're going to live our lives as if we're living in the full purpose of our lives, not this shutdown lockdown thing. The season has changed. The bondage of your barren winter has ended. There's a memory verse for you. The bondage of my barren winter has ended and the season of hiding is over and gone. The rains have soaked the earth and left it bright with blossoming flowers. The season for singing has arrived. Makes you want to sing, doesn't it? I'm going to, I'm going to finish it in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Maybe we could stand because you guys could see this verse from where you are, right? tell you what you have no rival you have no equal <clears throat> you know it's just very humbling to understand that the way the world treats us is all based on our qualifications you know you, you go on a job interview and you find out you didn't get the job interview and you feel like failure right you shouldn't because there's 50 other people applying for that job but Jesus is saying anybody's allowed in you don't have to send me your resume. If you're breathing, you qualify for salvation. All right, well, you don't know what, what I've done. You don't know the kind of sins I've been involved in. Well, we don't have to know specifically what those sins are. He's an equal opportunity freedom giver. Just like the devil is an equal opportunity destroyer, right? And he doesn't care. And, and Jesus is saying, if you come to me with a willing heart, no matter what your past is, you might not even be able to look yourself in the mirror. I mean, Mike Hutch Hutchings was saying that when he was here talking about trauma, that some people have been so traumatized they can't even look at themselves in the mirror. And it might be a soldier that had to do some really horrible things on the battlefield and never, never would have thought he was capable of doing those things. But all he was doing was trying to be true to his mission, and that's, that's what they told him to do, that he had to kill the enemy. And then a side of that personality came out that, you never would have wanted to even think existed. So in the name of doing your job for your country, you saw a side of yourself that was just not something you ever would have wanted to see. And that's how sin is. That's how the accuser is. He just keeps coming in and reminding you of all the ways you failed and everything you did wrong. And then you start getting depressed. So you listen to music that just keeps reminding you of that. And then people just think, you know what? This life is too tough. I'm just going to end it because then at least I'll be at peace. This is the ultimate lie of the enemy, that you'd be better off if you weren't even here. That is a lie. Break that lie right now. We choose life. That's what you say. We choose life. 
We're not going to let the enemy rob that hope, right? Because we know what happens to that broken spirit. It, it can go down when it's broken in, in, in depression, not humility. So look at what it says here. It's such a beautiful verse. Hebrews 2, 14 says, Jesus became human to fully identify with us. And when Carolyn was doing the communion today, she said, we break the bread. Don't just take it, but break it to remind ourselves that he broke himself for us. He fully identified with our humanity, even though he was fully God. And last week we talked about how Mary wept, right? And Jesus wept when Mary wept about her brother Lazarus. He's, he's touched with the feelings of our weakness too. He's fully man. He's not Mr. Spock on Star Trek. You know, I don't, I, that does not compute. He knows us. He cries with us. He weeps with us. It breaks his heart when we sin because he knows that we're going to be the ones that are suffering the consequences of that. And look, there could be people watching right now. There could be people here. And, and you just don't know this side of God. You only know the side of God that you've heard is ready to punish you. And we're saying, no, he's a father. He talked to Mary. The first person when he rose was a an ex-prostitute who had seven demons cast out of her. So it doesn't matter what's happened to you before. That's looking in the rearview mirror. God's here right now. And he's saying, you can make a decision to come and be on my side, and I'll help you, and I'll walk you through this process of healing and filling you with my power and presence. And then you'll get plugged into a local church of believers who are crazy for Jesus. Yeah. You can call me a Jesus freak anytime you want. I don't mind that at all. Jesus became human to fully identify with us. Even the bad part, even though he didn't sin, he understood what we were going through. And he did this so that he could experience death and annihilate the effects of the intimidating accuser. See, that's when the cycle of death got broken. When he came out of that tomb, it's like, you now have a choice. You do not have to stay locked in that death spiral because the cycle of death has been broken by my resurrection. I put that spirit inside of you. I'm going to annihilate the effects of Satan, that intimidating accuser who holds against us the power of death. And in another translation it says, who all their lives were tormented by the spirit of death. Think that's a common problem today with COVID? Whew. By embracing death, Jesus sets free those who live their entire lives in bondage to their tormenting dread of death. How many have been set free? Make some noise, okay? It's a good feeling, isn't it? I don't think Lazarus came out of the tomb and went, all right, well, what's today's coffee at Starbucks? He was dancing and twirling. He's like, oh my God, I'm out of that tomb. Right? Like, if that's true, we should be excited about it. I don't have to live in bondage to the fear of death. I can live my life on a mission now for whatever God has for me. And you're surrounded by a bunch of people who don't think they're perfect in this church anyway, right? Like we all know that we've got problems, but that's not the issue. It's how do we get whole? How do we get better? How do we live? You're not going to be shamed or judged. Hopefully, if you are, you let me know. But look, you know, this is the deal right here is make a decision that you're gonna try. I said it last week, Trisha and I didn't know each other before we were saved, but we both had come to a place where we said, what do I have to lose? My life is not in a good place right now. I'll try Jesus because everything else is going wrong. And boy, he met us right where were we at. Anybody have that testimony? He met you right where you were at. He made himself real to you. So that's a good way to end is just to say, if there's somebody here who doesn't know the Lord, that you can invite him into your heart. And we all made that decision. Everybody here that considers themselves a born-again Christian made a decision. You know, and I know how it could be. Like, life has a way of dealing a hand where you're not living in the fullness that you might have once had as a Christian. So even if, there, if that's you, if you feel like you're living underneath the ultimate that he has, we can pray, Lord, come and fill me with your power and your presence. I want a fresh baptism of your presence. I want an awareness of your Holy Spirit. So let's say this prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I heard good news today that Jesus died to take the punishment that I deserved. I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse me with that blood that I could be a member of your family, part of the bride adopted as a child into the inheritance of God. I ask you to fill me, Lord with the knowledge of your word 
and the presence of your power to strengthen me against sin and to allow myself to understand your word and serve you for the rest of my life and for eternity. I accept you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Now, for those of you that feel like you're less than right now, we'll just say, Lord, please restore me back to the joy of my salvation. You can all say it out loud together. We can just pray it together. Lord, restore me back to the joy of my salvation that I would not beat myself up, that you'd give me the strength to forgive myself and to move on and fulfill the assignment that you have for me. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's it. I don't want to keep you any longer. We, uh, I want the devil to get as many black eyes as he can today. And every time you say no to him and yes to God, it's another black eye for him. So we have, we have prayer people at the altar most weeks, but because it's Easter Sunday, we have family things today. We said, okay, if you, if you didn't want to do that, that's okay. But I'm not running out anytime soon. So don't feel like you have to run out. And if the Lord touched you and you just want somebody to pray with you, please come up. I just want to say a prayer to bless you guys as you go, okay? So, Lord, I thank you for the congregation here at King of Kings and also for those watching online. We thank you for somebody that might have said yes to you and accepted your invitation to come into your kingdom. There's no greater place to be in this world. And, Lord, we just speak healing and life to every one of those people that feel like the winter is still going on. We say the winter has passed. Springtime has come, and it's a time, it's a season to sing again in Jesus' name. Y'all have an awesome day. Love y'all.